So yeah, welcome everyone to this uh, Siam Scottish Branch webinar, River Rhine Invasive Species, Their Impacts and Mitigation Strategies, um, which is part of the Siam Biodiversity Digital Series. I hope everyone can hear me. Simon, can you hear me okay? I can, thank you. Yeah. Good, good. Um, we'll start off with a little bit of housekeeping um, and some Siam uh, focused stuff. So um, we've got uh, Barbara on from HQ um and she'll be kind of supporting us throughout this event um basically we would like to highlight that it's world water week next week um and if you go onto the world water week uh, official website um it's your last chance uh, for people to register for free tickets i imagine they've got some free webinars and events um, and barbara will be adding some of those into the chat function for you to have a look at there's also lots of really interesting COP26 information on the website. There's blogs, there's guidance, um, and SciWim are putting new things out um, almost on a kind of weekly, daily basis. Um, so please check that out on the SciWim website if you haven't already. Um, like with a lot of institutions, uh, SciWim has gone digital for 2021. Um, so we're no longer... Uh, stuck with the boundaries of our branches of events we can get to pretty much every single branch around uh, the UK and internationally are doing their events online um, so those webinars uh, can be accessed and you can and find those on the events page so again Barbara will be putting some links in there but please keep checking the Simon website um, for events also Simon HQ put a lot of uh, interesting formal training as well so um, do look into that as well. So there's lots of uh, online um, resources to be used to be to be found and to be attended uh, until the end of the year. So um, yeah, lots of interesting stuff there. Um, in terms of the Scottish branch, uh, we have another webinar coming up on the 9th of September, and that's titled Resilience Planning in the Water Industry, which uh, our very own Mark, who's on the call today and supporting uh, us on doing the question and answers for Simon, um, he's going to be part of that. And uh, that's on the 9th of September again, and that will be on the website very soon. So please look out for that. Um, and uh, Please, if you can, add the Scottish branch on LinkedIn. That tends to be the main place that we do uh, kind of advertise events and things um, and maybe a useful way to expand your network as well. Um, next week, we also have the Scottish branch AGM. Um, so if you're looking to get involved with the branch committee, uh, it's a great opportunity to further your professional network, your professional development, maybe outside of your work environment. Uh, and it's an a uh, really awesome way of supporting your chartership submission or just your membership sub um, sub uh, submission as well if you're a graduate. Um, so please check the website for that. Uh, Barbara will put the link in there. But if you're interested, please get in contact with myself. You'll see my email on there. Our chair, Alice, who's, who's not with us today, but um, her email's there as well. So please contact, contact us for any questions. Um, and if you want to just just sign up and come along and see what we're up to for 2021 and 2022, um, I would say it's a really rewarding experience and something that you can get out of your professional life that isn't just job focused and project focused. Um, if we look on the, the slide now, um, I'm sure some of you have already read for it, but uh, we're going to be recording this. Um, and Simon, I believe you're happy for that to go up on the SciWem YouTube account. So um, if you get pulled away um, and there's other things going on um, at home or wherever you might be, um, then um, you can catch up online. Um, if you experience any technical issues, uh, please use the chat feature down in the bottom um, for anything like that. And also in the chat feature, if you've got Barbara, any questions for Barbara, sorry, um, at HQ, anything to do with SciWeb specifically, then, then put it in the chat function as well. Um, we will take most of your questions at the end, although Simon is keen to kind of have those questions fired at him during, during the chat. Um, so so um, please, as soon as you've got a question, put it in, put it in the Q&A window um, and, uh, and we'll get going with those. And uh, yeah, just like what it says at the bottom, uh, we've got one hour of CPD uh, available for this. So please add it. Um, Add it in after the after the event, um, and that's probably everything from me. Um, so 
we'll go on to tonight's webinar. Uh, we're pleased to welcome back Simon, uh, following on from previous events he's done for SciWEM in person, um, both for his company Naturally Compliant and the Association of Environmental Clerk of, Clerk of Works. Uh, Simon Knott is the Director of Naturally Compliant and Environmental Consultancy, focused on providing resources to the construction sector. Simon has worked on several large scale linear projects, gaining real world experience of invasive non native species. Um, that is enough from me. So I will uh, hand over to you, Simon, um, and you can take it away. Thanks very much. Um, yeah. Um, so as, as we've mentioned, my name is, is Simon Knott. I own a, a company called Naturally Compliant. Um, I think it would be really helpful before we get into the main body of this is if we could, or the, the participants, if you can just let us know um, where you're from in terms of country um, and your job title as well. And that'll just help me um, focus the content to, to relevant to your, com uh, well, to the country and to your, your jobs. And um, so if you could just um, bob in just, where you're from um, and, and what it is that you do. That'd be awesome. Uh, into the, the chat box. Simon, Simon, what I can do is I can produce a report which will show just, how many people are, are here and I can, I can pop that in the chat later on. Sure, um, yeah, okay, fair enough. Uh, primarily because the, the legislation is different and the biodiversity net gain is a, a mandatory thing in England. Um, where it's not yet in Scotland. So it's just the relevance of all that. Um, but yeah, if we could get that information, that would be amazing. Um, as Oliver had, had mentioned, if you do have any questions, um, then please do pop them onto the, the q and I'm sure, well, for, for everybody, these kind of things are a lot better if there's a bit of interaction. Um, so I would appreciate that. The information here is, is more um, about actually asking for, for help rather than me putting my CV online. Um, so I'm a, a chartered environmentalist um, and a, a full member of IEMA. Um, I'm a full member of the Association of Environmental Clerk of Works. And I also sit on the management, management committee for the Association of Environmental Clerk of Works. For my sins, I am also a co-chair of the IEMA ACAL working group that focuses on post-consent and construction phase environmental performance. So um, if there's anybody that's listening out there um, that is interested in um, helping out and getting involved in in anything really that, that we're looking at here i appreciate that everybody's got a lot of a lot of professional work to do and and a lot of are potentially involved in in other committees and, and working groups um but we do we are looking for support not just from iema members um the construction phases obviously involve um, a lot of technical disciplines and um, so we'd be looking for support from from throughout basically Um, so the, the presentation that we, I'm, I'm going to deliver is, is River Invasive Species, Their Impact and Mitigation Strategies. We're going to firstly look at what invasive non-native species are, um, probably um, more commonly known as invasive species. Look at the legal context. The main offenders, uh, as we'll get on to, there are loads of invasive non-native species um, and I certainly don't have the time to oh, I, mean, I wouldn't expect you to, to have the time to listen to, to me talk about all of them so we're just going to focus on the ones that um, are, are more common um, certainly in, in the riverine uh, systems. The biodiversity impact that these species can have um, look at management solutions and then how those management systems and the solutions are actually implemented um, into 
during construction phase um, or during operational phase. So an invasive non-native species, as per the RSPB's definition, is a species which have been introduced into areas outside the natural range through human actions are posing a threat to native wildlife. So there are loads of, of non-native species. Um, it's the, the invasive ones, that, the ones that causes real problems that, that we want to focus on um, and which is covered predominantly through this presentation. So in terms of legal context, the, the main legislation focusing on, on invasive non-native species or ends um, is the Wildlife Countryside Act. Um, and this is actually, there are separate versions for England and Wales and for Scotland, uh, as, I, as I mentioned. So um, this is the, the chapter related to invasives in, in England and Wales. And this is the version in Scotland. Um, so ultimately, I'm going to focus here particularly on plants. Um, if any person plant, or in England and Wales, if any person plants or otherwise causes, otherwise causes to grow in the wild, any plant which is included in part two of Schedule 9, he shall be guilty of an offence. Um, however, in Scotland, it's any person who plants or otherwise causes to grow any plant in the wild that place out with its, nat its native range is guilty of an offence. Um, so one of the, the main points there is that, well, potentially you'll hear a lot about Schedule 9, certainly in relation to, to invasives. Um, and this is why it's important to, to understand who's listing where, um, because Schedule 9 doesn't really um, apply to, to Scotland. So it's any species that's out with its natural range we need to, to be aware of. Um, there is case law around um, invasives. However, it's not necessarily case law to do with the Wildlife Countryside Act. Um, it's more to do with whether it's a, an actionable nuisance. Um, and you will have heard or potentially read the, the notes. And anybody's super interested, there, there are links um, at the end of this presentation, but if you just type in network rail and Japanese knotweed, um, there's loads of information now about what happened. So basically network rail are, are deemed to, to be responsible for, for Japanese knotweed sort of encroaching into other people's land. And so they're now obliged to, to manage that Japanese knotweed. And as we'll get onto in a bit later on, um, it can be massively expensive and very time consuming. So that's that's the legal context. So I've got the, the particular parts about plants here. Um, it's very much the same for, for animals. So if we're talking about mink or um, American signal crayfish, there's the, the obligation to, to not spread or cause to spread the, um, these, these animals or plants beyond the natural range. So in terms of invasives, um, are there any questions actually on the, the legal side of things before we, we move on? Does it seem to be? Okay. So in terms of inns, as I said, there, there are loads. And because of the, the specific wording in Scotland, um, there, then I, I mean, ultimately causing something to grow outside its, nat its native range, although not in a domestic setting, um, can, it can potentially present a, a constraint. Um, the, the numbers of plants or species uh, is, is significant. So 
if we look at Schedule 9 um, of the Wildlife Countryside Act, there are 52 plant species listed on that. Um, and as I said, we don't have the time to, to go through all of them. Um, however, I've, I've chosen three um, that are the main offenders, especially surrounding the water environment. So we're looking at Japanese knotweed, Himalayan balsam, and giant hogweed. Um, throughout all of this, um, as I, I suppose it's, it's relevant to everything, um, we're not going to make you experts in any of this. So if you, it's always prudent to, to rely on somebody that's appropriately qualified or experienced to survey for these. Um, and the advice that I'll be talking about in terms of mitigation strategies, there are companies that are, that are experts in this. Um, it's rarely simple to deal with, with any of these um, invasive species and certainly time and, and money come into to play. So we're looking at Japanese knotweed, Himalayan balsam and giant hogweed. Um, So as you can see, um, this is a Japanese knotweed stand and um, we'll be going into it's a little bit of its ecology shortly. Um, but that sort of it starts to dominate the, the riverine bank. Um, this is a, a picture from the Clyde, just a glass of green. And the, the plant where it's circled red, that's Japanese knotweed. Um, fortunately, we've actually got Himalayan balsam, well, unfortunately, we've got Himalayan balsam over the other side of the bank. Um, and then there's actually a big stand of, of giant hogweed to the, the left there where my, my cursor is, if you can see that. Um, so Japanese knotweed um, is a, a big problem, uh, as I understand it when the Victorians brought the, the plant over for their gardens, they actually only brought female plants. Um, so it, it doesn't spread. There are no, it's not spread by seed. It's not a sexual reproduction. It's, it's, um, it spreads by plant matter um, and, and the rhizomes as well. So when we're, we're thinking about a riverine structure or a system, um, when the when there's floods or when there's um or through the winter when the plant sort of dies away and the the banks are less stable um there's more there's a lot more um, opportunity for for the plants to to spread um through that flooding event um as as the plants are, are broken away and you can create a new plant by um, the size of, or a, a piece of plant matter the size of your thumbnail and that can spread in, into a, a new stand of Japanese knotweed. Um, Japanese knotweed is incredibly resilient um, and it takes, as I said, um, a lot of time um, and it can be very expensive to, to, to manage it and, and eradicate it completely. Speaking to Mark just before we started this um, this presentation and um, he was saying that it's costing them lots of money and typically the, the management approach for Japanese knotweed is actually to bury it um, as hazardous waste and that requires all the, the, all the compliance systems and, and setups and requirements from, from your environmental agency. Um, and you also need to to be to dig a big hole and, and put the Japanese knotweed in there. Um, and there's obviously specifications for for entombing the, the Japanese knotweed. So if you do have Japanese knotweed on your site, then always seek advice from a, a Japanese specialist who can provide input into to how to manage it appropriately. Um, there are different ways and means. Um, certainly, I've heard of, of people using electricity, so they um, basically try and electrocute the, the plant and that um, the idea is to, to kill the, the roots and the stems. 
um, other ways are um, sort of herbicides and I think probably one of the most in terms of time um, is to to bury the the material. The next one is Himalayan balsam and you can see the the flowers here. So the Himalayan balsam is a growing annual. Um, it can discharge seeds up to seven meters from the plant. Um, so when the seeds are, are ready to go and when the, the seed pods are, are fully formed, if you even touch the seed pod, then it will, uh, I mean, I say explode, but um, it does sort of, there is physical force to disperse, disperse the seeds. And so you can, um, the, the figure is seven meters from the plant. Um, <clears throat> each plant can produce 800, up to 800 seeds and the seeds can remain viable in the seed bank for up to three years. Um, so again, because this is, a, is an annual, it, grow, it dies back through the winter and exposes the, the bank of the, of the river, of the watercourse. Um, and so in a flood event or, or just in, in normal winter um, events, then the, the seeds can, can be taken down, downstream. Um, and because they can survive for, for three years in the, in the seed bank, in the, in the, the bank of the, the watercourses, um, it's very difficult for, for people to, or in terms of the management structure. So essentially, we're going to have to go back every three years um, and, and manage that population of Himalayan balsam. And then finally, giant hogweed. So again, brought in in, in, Vic, in Victorian times. Um, there is common hogweed um, in the UK, uh, but it is obviously a lot smaller. Um, but during the growing season, or at the start of the growing season in the spring, one of the, I think one of the best ways that I've heard um, the way to, to tell the difference between giant hogweed and, and normal hogweed is that giant hogweed looks a lot angrier. Um, that is, it's got a lot more spiky bits on its leaves. It's a bit yellower compared to, to our normal hogweed. Um, this again is a, a fast growing annual. Um, so it dies back over the winter. Um, you probably be more aware of it through, through its sap. Um, so basically, if you get the sap on your skin, um, the, the sap sort of removes the ability of your skin to, to sort of protect itself from sunlight. So you, you get lots of blistering. Um, and that can, can, pro, uh, can stay with you for, for a little while. Um, it's not as if it can just be fixed. So something to be very aware of um, when you're, you're managing or trying to remove giant hogweed. Um, a single plant can produce, which is, is staggering, 20 to 30,000 seeds um, per, per year or per plant. Um, and again, the, the seeds can remain viable in the seed for up to three years. So they all present um, different sort of constraints and, 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 um, and sort of challenges to, to management. So in terms of biodiversity and the and sort of feeding into the 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 sort of the, the reasoning behind this series of, of presentations. Um, invasive non-native species they're, they're bad because they outcompete our native species in one way or another. another. Um, so when we're talking about, certainly when we're talking about Japanese knotweed, Himalayan balsam and, and giant hogweed, uh, they grow a lot faster um, and they sort of outcompete. So obviously 
of the, the amount of seeds that they can produce. They end up totally dominating the bankside riparian habitat, um, which causes problems in itself. Um, they can introduce new pathogens and diseases, so that's the particular concern with the American signal crayfish, in that it's introduced a, a disease that um, is really destroying our white clawed, our native white clawed crayfish populations. Um, so that's something that we we really need to get a, a handle on. Hybridization. Um, yeah, this is is more well. I think it's probably the the most um, notable hybridization of of a, a non-native species, probably wild cat and our own domestic cat um, populations of wild cats have have decreased massively. Um, so hybridization is a problem, um, and then. In, specific terms related to, to the water environment. There's a, an increased risk of erosion um, and sediment in the, the freshwater environment. So these all, or it can have significant impacts on our, our biodiversity um, of, of, our, of our native environment. And as you can see, here, this again from the, the bank of the Clyde. Um, this whole bank here is, is Himalayan balsam, and then you've got a stand of, of giant hogweed just forming at the back. And through the winter, all of this will be exposed um, to, well, to erosion. And again, this is just to reinforce the how quickly these cow the the abundance and domination of, of the invasive species. Um, so we've got, again, Himalayan balsam here and, and giant hogweed in the, in the corner on the right hand side. So in terms of management, we what typically happens or what's historically happened is that um, through through development or I'm speaking particularly from a construction phase or a development, there'll be project specific biosecurity management plans. Um, these will be identified from the, the pre-construction, the, well, the EIA or the, the impact assessment phase where um, ecologists and, and whoever else will go out and identify what the risks are and, and then we'll sort of tell the, the planning authorities or who, whomever how they're going to manage their risk. Um, if we go back to the, the legislation where it talks about that you're, you're not going to cause the, the, the spread of a, of a non-native invasive species, what usually happens is that the construction phase will just pop a buffer around the, the invasive species um, and make sure that nobody goes into that area. Um, this means that everything's very cheap. Um, there's no, no risk of, of the invasive species getting onto pieces of a plant or, or equipment or in some cases personnel and moving that species to a new location. Therefore, you're complying with the, the Wildlife Patricide Act. So everything's very passive. Um, I don't know if there's a, a few people from, from England on the call or, or certainly from, or um, have heard of biodiversity net gain. Uh, it's been a, a big step change in, in how we sort of manage development projects. So um, in England, most projects, um, I'm pretty sure, will need to, to prove that there's going to be a biodiversity net gain from that development. Um, it's not quite made it to Scotland yet, but uh, you can, can imagine that that probably will be coming in the, the near future. And what that means is that it requires the project to increase the biodiversity of the development site. Um, and as we've discussed, 
uh, invasive species can have a significant impact on, on the biodiversity of a site. And so one of the, the easier ways or one of the ways that you can improve that is to, to manage your invasive species. So that's going to take active management of the invasive species. Um, so instead of just sort of um, burying it off and, and making sure that nobody goes into it, projects are going to actually have to start looking at how to, to manage their, their species uh, or manage the invasive species that are on their, on their project. So that's a real step away. So construction, typically, we would just fence it off. Now we're going to have to actually manage it. Um, however, sort of, well, in terms of management of invasive species, as I've discussed, with the, with the amount of seeds produced by certain species um, and with the with the sort of the way that Japanese knotweed spreads, certainly in riverine systems, um, we should be looking at a catchment-wide approach because if you um, remove all the the Japanese knotweed or the Himalayan balsam or, or whatever it is from your development site, if you've got invasive species upstream, then in time you're going to get a problem again. Um, and I think biodiversity net gain has is, is only recently been introduced, and so it's it's still a work in progress. And I, I think until we, we get examples and until um, people start sharing their, their experiences, um, we're not going to be totally sure on how this plays out. But I think there's a, a massive opportunity um, that projects can communicate with, the, with each other and coordinate an approach. Um, so certainly in, in England, again, because it's, it's mandatory, um, developments or developers should be, be taking a, a coordinated approach to, to looking at catchment-wide management of invasive species. So in terms of implementation um, and, and management strategies, as I said, uh, it's, it's important to get the right people to provide advice to the project. Now, you would expect that to happen at impact assessment, but um, impact assessment doesn't always catch everything that's, that's on, a, on, a con or on a project. Um, so, Definitely uh, through your your roles in in the in the system, um, certainly look for for specialists to to provide advice on on how to manage these these invasive species. Um, it can be quite convoluted in terms of the management system. So as we've spoken about for for Japanese knotweed, um, you can you can bury it. Um, but you can also apply um, other means and, and methods. But typically that will take years. Um, as I've said in the, the Himalayan balsam side of things, um, you can take out all the, the Himalayan balsam, but you've still got three years worth of viable seed left in the, in the seed bank. So somebody through operation and maintenance is going to have to come back every three years to pull out the Himalayan balsam. Um, the same can be said for, for giant hogweed. Um, I definitely wouldn't recommend pulling giant hogweed out, but you can apply herbicides to, to giant hogweed. But again, you'd have to go back every three or a year for, for, until the, there are no more viable seeds left in the seed bank. But that also brings in another risk in that you're applying a herbicide right next to a water course. And so there are all the regulatory um, standards that you have to follow. So really do speak to, to a, a specialist company that have got, very, have got experience in, in managing invasive species. Um, 
what I mean, it's a bugbear of mine, and it goes back to the the post con saying and the, the construction phase performance environmental working group that we've got going on. But we need to be very clear on what we want to happen in the impact assessment. So we should really be speaking to these specialists at the impact assessment stage, having a clear understanding of what we're going to do at that stage. Um, and then we need to put that into the contract for whoever's managing the, the project. So this is specifically referring to construction. Um, but if we're wanting a, a specific thing, then we need to write it into the, the contract or we need our the people writing the contracts to write it into the contract. So go back to the, the O&M. There's no point in pulling Himalayan balsam if in, into or in, nobody then goes and follows it up two to three years later. Um, because you're just going to get a, a repeat in, in infestation. Um, similarly, we need to start looking at catchment wide and looking at how we can improve and sort of coordinate all these things. Um, we've got a question on any examples of projects from different developers coordinating a catchment wide approach to INS management. Um, Yes, I mean, and this sounds great in theory, but hard to achieve in reality. What would be a recommended approach to gain company buy-in? Um, well, ultimately, uh, once biodiversity net gain um, its feet and becomes a lot more centralized and a lot more standard, um, you'll see, well, I mean, you'll, you'll have to see approaches like this come into, into play. Um, there's uh, I know of, of systems or of, of um, examples, but not necessarily about invasive species, but impacts on SACs and SPAs for, for geese down in on the south coast near Southampton, where each house that the developer built had a cost sort of built into um, improving habitat for geese that in an area that would be protected from development. Um, and I'd imagine that it'd be something similar in this. So once biodiversity net gain gains traction, um, then you would look at sort of creating a, a legal agreement between developers in a, a catchment that says, I don't know, 10 pounds, that's an arbitrary figure from each each um, house or, or flat or whatever is put into a pot that then goes to to implementing this in ins management. Um, does that answer that question? Can maybe come back to that after. Um, and then in terms of. Um, uh, sort of another thing that's also very important to me is project compliance assessment. So it's all well and good as saying that we're going to do X, Y, and Z. But if nobody's there to check that we've done X, Y, and Z, then how do we know what's working and what's not working? So like I've like what like I said about the, the geese in, in Southampton. If no, if we're not checking that the the developers and the projects and everything are complying with with what we we're asking of them we don't know what works and what doesn't work so it might be too difficult to to look at a, a catch and wide approach um in a in a conventional sense um so we then go away and, and have a think about how we can achieve it in a in a different way and and try and um and try and meet the the regulations and and meet the the challenges rather than just saying that it's it's too difficult um how do we as a as a an industry as a as a, a body of professionals how do we get to the point where we can actually achieve that um so project compliance assessment is, is super important um, to, to provide that, that feedback. Uh, 
um, finally, this is the most basic, but yet the most important thing that anybody dealing with INS um, across the board, not ne necessarily just with in, uh, riverine systems, um, is known as the, the check, clean, dry um, procedure. And basically, what you need to do is we need to to clean off all of, of if we're working in an environment where the, we know that there are invasive species and probably just as good practice where, where we don't know that they're invasive species um, is to clean the plant thoroughly, make it spotless. Um, well, check, the, check the, the, the plant first, then clean it and then dry it. So especially in a, a riverine system, um, it, there's a, a lot of the, the the invasive species require water and so if you dry that out then it, it makes it a lot less likely that the the species can survive to be spread elsewhere and um, so from an invasive species point of view um, if you take anything away from this presentation then it's the the check clean dry um, process and I suppose if you check online um, for or type in check clean dry um, toolbox talks or, or whatever, um, there'll be loads of toolbox talks on on that because it's it's our first line um, of defense against invasive species. Um, and then there are just some links about non-native species. Um, there's a, a non-native species secretariat that's that's set up by DEFRA. Um, there's a lot of good information on there. Um, the Wildlife Countryside Act is is obviously the basis for for a lot of this stuff. Um, and then we've got um, a, a Welsh publication on on Himalayan balsam and controlling it on your land. Um, and that is. Everything from me, if we go to the Q and A, if there is any questions. I'll ask one, Simon. Um, if uh, well, well, maybe people add things in there. So. Um, I, I can't add, I can't actually ask a question because I'm a panelist, but um, you you give some examples of where you have um, all three invasive species next to each other. Is mm -hmm. that is that like a common is that quite a common occurrence or is that just or yeah is that a common occurrence or is that something that you've just found on the Clyde? <laughs> <laughs> Might be that the Clyde is notoriously bad. Um, no, I think it's. Certainly when you look through different systems, um, I suppose remaining in Glasgow on the Kelvin, you'll find exactly the same thing. Um, and I guess it's, I, I don't know the, the details for sure, but um, associated with, with industry and, and a lot of movement. So it's very, very easy to spread these, these species. Um, and ultimately, the waterways, the, the water environment is, is a, a really good receptor for it. Um, so I would probably suggest that it is quite common, um, certainly in, in industrial areas. Um, saying that, I found a, I worked on a project in Cumbria, which was in the, the lakes. Um, I mean, there, there were done, surveys done a good kilometer around the, the linear route and we found Japanese knotweed just in the middle of nowhere. Um, so yeah, sometimes it's, it's very difficult to understand how they get there, but at the same time, um, yeah, it's, it's for, certainly for those three species to be found um, in the same location. If there's anyone from England, um, floating pennywort is becoming a lot more pro problematic, certainly in, in the, in the canal systems um but yeah i guess it's uh, in that situation yeah, it's, it's certainly interesting to, to see how we're, we're going to manage all of these invasives mark you had your hand up 
Or have you had your hand up for a long time? You made a very good point, Simon, about the need to constantly follow up with Japanese not uh, with Japanese not weed and Himalayan balsam uh, and hogweed and that. And one of the things that we'd found when we were working on the project sites was it took us about five years with Himalayan balsam. And we had to come back every year and keep coming back. And there was always one or two plants you missed. I think you were back into that three-year cycle, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. is, is that a common... Is that, is that something that puts developers off, do you think? Yes, I mean, certainly there's there's a cost element. I know yeah. um, a lot of a lot of, sort of the the green volunteer groups will go out and do what's called balsam bashing, and yeah. can be it's a, a great way for for company like large companies to to spend their their time on these volunteering things. But yeah, um, and this goes back to contract and an agreement that. The, the O and M side of things, you you really need to follow up. Otherwise, there's like you can do everything in in the one year, but if you don't come back, then you'll have the same problem. Yeah. And and typically, if it isn't a, a catchment approach, um, then you you'll potentially have problems later down through the line. But I, I'm not sure until we get um more information from biodiversity net gain and how that works um, I'm not sure um, how that will impact thank you um, so quick question there any useful apps or tools for helping non-experts identify ins on sites um, yeah I'm sure um, certainly as I said the, the non-native or the invasive non-native species secretariat they have loads of information um, and useful tools to, to help identify species um, but I guess it goes back to the point if this is a commercial enterprise um, then we should really be engaging with with the specialists for that, um, but that's not to say that you you can't identify something and then ask for help further down the line. We, we've found that one or two of the online applications, Simon, where you can actually photograph the plant mm -hmm. and get the identity, we've found they're not as reliable as people think they are. Yeah. Which I, really takes you back to ask a specialist, ask somebody that knows. I mean, yeah, I can't, yeah. Um, with those with those apps that you take photos of yeah. i <laughs> as a professional I've, I've i was an ecologist for a long time um, and i sort of stepped away from ecology but i wouldn't rely on them too much um and also we we had a site in in scotland with some japanese knotweed that didn't look like japanese knotweed. Um, so when japanese knotweed is stressed it can change like it doesn't have the the usual um sort of identifiers as such it will have some um but it just looked strange um so it's always best to to speak to to the specialist but as i say um there are, there are tools out there, but if we're getting into commercial side of things, then, then it's probably best to, to speak to somebody that, that's an expert in that field. Any other questions? With the, I've just had a quick look on the, on the website and there's an app which the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology adapted with the University of Bristol. Mm -hmm. um, it was updating, it's a plant track. But they've got a special um, section now for non-invasive plants. Is that quite a good start perhaps for people? Groups, groups of volunteers to use 
Um, and obviously then they can talk to professionals as well, but is that sort of a good introduction for them? Um, yeah, uh, and because, well, yeah, uh, as I say, I, I'm, I don't know, I'm not sure I can endorse any one particular app, um, but they, there will be loads of apps out there um, because invasives are, are so common. Um, they most companies will have information on their page as to, to what all the, as I say, the key identifiers for, for invasive species. I think the, the stuff for like the, the plant tracking, the, the invasive species tracking and like the National Biodiversity Network um, platforms that allow you to register where you've seen species is invaluable as part of the citizen science movement. Um, it's a, a really strong opportunity for us to, to identify risk areas. Um, so if anybody's involved in, or if, if anybody identifies invasive species, um, then yeah, please do go on, on to NBN and, and register um, uh, your sighting. Um, and there, there may well be other websites that allow you to do that, but it just gives everybody a better chance of, of understanding where invasives are and where they've got to. Is there a general point for all of us out with these three sort of species that you've been, uh, selected, Simon, to be conscious of our environmental impacts? And that even when we're doing something as um, simple as our own tidying up our own gardens or planting and selecting plants in our own gardens, thinking about how we dispose of that garden waste, thinking about our cleaning our own boots and stuff before we go for a walk with the dog and stuff like that. Because I, as a keen gardener, I can think of a lot of plants in my garden that I just wouldn't like to see in the environment. You know, they'd go, they'd, 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 they'd rip through it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, yeah. I, just a thought. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think we need to be conscious of, of our own impact. Um, American skunk cabbage, I think, has <laughs> come up relatively recently. Gunner is um, another one. A good water plant, Gunner. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that will have come from somebody's garden. Uh, and yeah, absolutely. I think it is important. I know it's incumbent on us to, to be aware of this thing, these things. So the, the clean, the check clean dry motto, if we can follow through with that, we'll be in a good place. Um, but yeah, I think in terms of invasives, um, you'll not, in terms of species that are on, certainly on schedule nine, um, you'll not be able, or shouldn't be able to pick those up at the, the garden centre. Um, and they're the ones that have been identified as being particularly risky. Oh. So if you can buy Himalayan balsam seeds, then <laughs> I would suggest you report that garden centre to, to somebody that, that would look at that. I know, I know we've encountered problems with Gunnera specifically and also rhododendron. And they cause us a lot of problems on catchment. Yeah. Yeah. And rhododendron's an, an interesting one. Like it's, I suppose, and ultimately, when does it become naturalized? So sycamore yeah. isn't, it shouldn't be here, but it's, we've had it for so long, it's become naturalized. Rhododendron, however, um, I, you, I don't know if people know this, but um, rhododendron leaves contain um, some kind of chemical that inhibits growth and just the very, because they drop so many leaves, it stops any seeds getting through to the, the soil. Um, and so they basically out eat everything um, by making the soil a little less in, um, viable for, for, the, for our native plants. Um, but also they just like literally it's a physical barrier. Um, so rhododendron is, is something that is, is also managed um, quite heavily. Well, um, thank you for all that, Simon. Really interesting um, kind of yeah, takeaways, both um, for the professional environment and also kind of your personal environment as well, isn't it, that, that Mark was touching on there. So um, always worth 
thinking about uh, the impact of yeah just hiking and moving around in your own garden and how that can impact on on your natural environment as well so yeah and um, thank you from from us at the, at the branch and, and obviously Sai Wen for for doing your uh, for, for doing your presentation today um, some really interesting stuff we will um, we won't shut down the webinar instantly um, straight away we'll leave it up just because it's useful for people to if they've got a few links they want to have a look at so there'll be a couple of minutes um, for you to grab any links that you need and yeah just one final plug from myself if you are interested in um, yeah getting involved in SIWEM uh, and getting involved in um, in the committee uh, then please have a look at the the Scottish SIWEM AGM uh, event um, on the SIWEM website and uh, maybe we'll uh, welcome you into the committee um, next week or just in the future. Um, but yeah, no, thank you everyone. And thanks again, Simon. No, thanks very much. And just on that, if we can, if there is anybody on um, that's listening that would be interested in getting involved in in the, the IEMA ACAL sort of working group, like we, we're looking at how to improve post, the, the whole process, post consent through construction. Um, we're basically trying to identify inhibitors to, to good environmental performance um, and trying to remove those from the system. So, um, yeah, if anybody's anybody's willing from a, a, a water point of view, that'd be awesome. Great. Cheers. No, oh, thank you. There's a lot of links you're adding in there, Barbara, into the chat. <laughs> thank you for that. There was a specific specific Scottish um, invasive plants, um, or invasive species um, initiative. I put in some of the links there to some of the plants that you were, you've been talking about. Yeah, I mean, because it's such a big problem, I think there were like, there's there's so many opportunities. Um, certainly, volunteering and um, opportunities or information out there on on invasive species. So. Yeah, it's sort of, well, it should be quite easy to, to find that information. Hmm. Um, could you, um, silly question now, now that we've finished, but could you use one of the invasive species to get rid of all the others? <laughs> um, biocontrol, I believe they call it, um, causes a lot more problems. Certainly look oh, at okay. it. Yep. Um, <laughs> I can't. There, something got really. I, I, I don't know the exact details, but cane toad springs a bell in Australia, where <laughs> there's just they released. I'm pretty sure they released cane toads to to try and fight a particular problem, and then there was no predation on the cane toads, so they they were just inundated with with cane toads, um, right. after. Yeah, so we, you really need to be very careful what species you, you bring in um, okay. if, you, if you do that, because yeah, it's a minefield. Um, but yeah, <laughs> I, it would be a, a very um, elegant solution. I think quite a lot of ecologists and biologists have looked at that in the past. And just there's quite a few issues. Mm, no, yeah. It's like, um, I guess, with, yeah, I've sort of, my question came from thinking about how they're trying to in introduce, aren't they, malaria free mosquitoes um, that would then, that, that aren't able to, to um, spread the disease. Mm -hmm. And then the aim is that they would take over. I have no idea whether they've been able to do that successfully. But um, yeah, with that, actually, um, they can sterilize American. Crayfish, and they release a load of males into the population, um, and because they can't reproduce, they have a massive impact on the populations. Um, and that's similar to what they're doing with like malarial control mosquitoes. They'll irrigate the poor male mosquitoes, um, and so then they're no longer viable, um, and that reduces the populations. So they are looking to do that. I think there's been pilots, certainly in the UK somewhere. 
That's a little bit more difficult with vegetative plants. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we got massively lucky that the uh, Japanese knotweed is only female, because if that could reproduce, then we would have a, a significantly bigger problem. Mm. Mm. No. So what controls Japanese knotweed in its natural environment? <laughs> yeah, good question. I'm not 100% sure on, on what it does and what does control it. Um, something that I'll have to look into. Yeah, I've got this image of just Japan. It's just overrun with Japanese. <laughs> I imagine it maybe isn't from Japan. That's just the name. But, <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, that's an interesting point, Barbara. Yeah, where, how have they controlled it? Where it's, I think sort it's of native? Just grown a lot of the time from memory. It's just they have a huge sort of um, ecosystem full of massive grasses and bamboos. And then there's a really interesting invertebrate that loves Japanese knotweed and really hammers it. And they were looking right. at introducing that at one point and then they found it would eat lots of things that were found in Europe, so they gave up. <laughs> That's what we were talking about earlier, wasn't it? Yeah, you sort yeah. of think, that would be a good idea. Let's introduce it before you know it. It's <laughs> eating everything else. So You've had that with the harlequin ladybirds, haven't you? They've actually, because they're a lot larger and they actually outcompete native ones and they actually predate some of the native ladybirds so there's a problem there now with that. Mm. Yeah. Oh very interesting. Cool. Right. Um should we should we bring it to a close there? I think so. Cool. Yeah I'd thanks like, again Simon. Um, I'd like to thank you all um and yeah for the Scottish branch for organizing this and for Simon for giving this interesting talk. And um, we have to keep an, an, our eye out for the Japanese knotweed and the, the Himalayan balsam and the giant hogweed. <laughs> and report it if you see it. Definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. No, thanks very much for having me. And uh, I will speak to you all soon, I think. No, yeah. thanks very much, Simon. Yeah. Okay, take care. Cheers. Keep Take safe. care, everyone. Bye. Bye.